Welcome to Story Hour in the Library, and thank you so much for being here. My name is Kristen Spronia, and I'm the Lunch Poems and Story Hour Coordinator. And before we start, I just want to let you know about a few upcoming events we have. On April 3rd, in the Morrison Library, we'll have our Lunch Poems reading with Jessica Fisher. She um, recently won the Yale Younger Poets Award and is a teacher here at Cal. And on April 17th, we'll have our final story hour in the library reading of the semester with Melanie Abrams, who will now introduce our reader today, Daniel Mason. Okay. Uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce my friend, Daniel Mason, today. Um, Daniel was born and raised in Northern California. He studied biology at Harvard and received a medical degree from the University of California, San Francisco. His best-selling first novel, A Piano Tuner, was written while he was a med student, a fact that I find both awe-inspiring and totally rage-inducing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was published in 2002 to glowing reviews. The Washington Post called it an ambitious, adventuresome, highly unusual first novel that offers pleasures too rarely encountered in contemporary American fiction. Mason is a gifted, original, and courageous writer, while the Kirkus Review called Daniel an irresistible amalgam of Kipling, Ryder Haggard, and Conrad at their very best, masterful. The Piano Junior has been translated into 28 languages, was adapted as an opera and a play, and is currently in production as a film. Daniel's second novel, A Far Country, was published in 2007, and has just been released in paperback, which means that all of you students can now buy it. Um, and it's back there, too, and Daniel, I'm sure, will be happy to sign copies afterward. Um, and it's been called by the Boston Globe a staggeringly beautiful meditation on poverty, migration, and class that stands as a worthy successor to Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath. In 2005, Daniel was a Townsend Fellow at UC Berkeley. He has also published stories in Harper's Magazine on such varied topics as price fighting, art, and mental illness, and the biologist Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, on a personal note, I am a big fan of Daniel's writing, and I'm always blown away by his gift for depicting such a myriad of people, places, and things. His ability to so authentically inhabit the world of such varied characters as an impoverished little girl, a talented mental patient, and an illiterate pugilist, which you'll hear about today. Um, in such varied locales and time periods as 19th century Burma, 19th century England, and contemporary Latin America. Um, and this kind of ability really inspires me as a writer, a reader, and a friend. So it is my great pleasure to introduce the botanophiliac, obsessive swimmer, and my frequent Rawlings lunch date companion, Daniel Mason. He of Bristol, son of James, son of Tom, son of Dizzy D, lifters all. She of Dublin and the cursed Gemini of poverty and fertility. Jacob was the twelfth of eighteen children, the third of the eight who survived. It was a typical Kayside childhood of odd jobs and shoe shining and sporadic bouts of schooling, of Quincy croup and the irresistible temptation of diving from the piers. 
In the summer, he ran with the flocks of children terrorizing the streets with their play. He grew up quickly, thick-necked, thick-shouldered, steel-fisted, tight-lipped, heavy on the brow. The boy knew neither a letter nor the taste sweet until his tenth year, when in the course of a single moon, he learned to lip out the rune on the shingle of the boy's arms and stole an apple from a costermonger on the road to Bath. Two brothers, thinking they were bona fide Dick Turpins, had treaded into a life of brigandage, but by the grace of his mother's daily prayers and his father's belt, Jacob Burke turned from the taste of apples and back to the straight and narrow of his bloodline, joining Burke Pear on the docks. On the docks he remained, lifting barrels of fish and slabs of iron cold from the sea air until his back broadened and his forearms broke his cuffs. The ascent of Burke, including the riots, also his early career and its vicissitudes. At age 19, Burke became known. On the quay was a man named Sam Jones, and Sam Jones was a Steve Dorr too, lifting with Burke from dark hour to dark hour. Sam Jones was an old man of 40 when one morning his foot punched a rotted board on the dock and he went down with a load of flounder, 150 pounds of fish in an oak slided crate that snapped his neck against the railing before he slumped, slipped, limp into the sea. Sam Jones had a month's wages coming, but the company didn't pay his widow, and on the docks the stevedores sat down and not a boat could move. Then the owners sent out their thugs, who fell on the man with clubs and iron pokers, and from the melee exploded the Kayside riots of fame. It was a newspaper man from London who first saw Burke throw a punch. When the riots were over, the newspaper man found the boy back at work, resigned, murmuring a sad low lifter song as he threaded the pier. The newspaper man talked a streak. Jacob, not accustomed to long converses, didn't set down his bag, said yes sir like he was taught to speak to elders and suited men, and occasionally repositioned the weight over his back. At long last, the fellow drew out a calling card. Well, what do you think? Ever fought? asked the man. On the card was the name of a warehouse on the harbor, where over the following week, Burke sent three men to the floor. They were hard affairs, fighters showing up on the minute as if it were nothing but a shake bag cockfight. No seconds, no ropes, no purse. If the fancy went, it was only to scout. On the third night, came a man named Karen who made an offer. How muscular became known. There are five fights that first year, five fights, and Jacob Burke wins four. They are hush matches, dueled in the warehouses, or country inns or levees east of the cities. Broughton's rules, bare knuckles, 24-foot ring, round ends when a man goes down. 30 seconds of rest, and the fight doesn't end until a man can't get back to the scratch. No gouging, no biting, no blows below the belt. No faking down to win a rest. Karen is his second. Also in his corner, holding his bottle, is an associate of Karen, a Yankee who'd once been champion in New Orleans. Yankee must have a Christian name, but he changes the subject when Jacob asks. They are good to him, treat him like a son, give him breeches and spiked shoes, read him the fighter's correspondence in the weekly dispatch, get him victuals when victuals are dear. Take him to the house of Madame de C, where they put up the socket fee and tell the girls that he will be champion of all England. There, amid the crepe and taffeta, he is humiliated by the men's attention, feels like he's back in the ring, half thinks Karen and Yankee will follow him and the girl to watch. When that winter his father is laid out with cough, they advance him money against his purses, and Jacob finds himself buying gifts for his mother and his little brothers and sisters. His winnings are small, five, ten pounds. He spends it all and borrows more. Before each fight, Karen takes him aside and tells him what the scum the others are, makes it sound like he's some avenging angel, meeting out justice to a line of murderers and thieves and virgin defilers. Jacob doesn't much care. He likes the chance to hit and watch his man fall. A halfpenny Bristol rag with a full page on the fist it covers his fights, but can't seem to settle on a moniker, calling him the Kayside Brawler, then Stevedore Burke, Bruce Burke, then Muscular, which Karen picks up for their promotions. It's elegant, thinks Jacob. He buys an extra copy of the rag and brings it home, 
shows, it to his uh, shows his mother where on the page it says muscular. To prove the magnitude of his strength, he grabs two of his youngest brothers, one in each hand, and lifts them squealing above his head. How it came about that Burke fought blind man. This is how it came about that Burke fought the blind man. In Lincolnshire, Broken Head Gaul lost to the moor, and in Liverpool, Will Skaggs beat Tom Johnson, who had no less than great, the great Peter Crawley in his corner, the butcher's son known in his day as the young rum steak. But Skeggs went by Broken Head, and at Mosley Hurst, Tom Tate lost to Rope Petit. So Broken fought Tate, but the fight was across, the weekly dispatch breaking the story that both men had met a fortnight before to fix. Then they went to Ted Shannon and Vainglorious, but Vainglorious and the blind man, and Vainglorious said that if he were going to get killed, he needed a bigger purse for his widow. This left the fancy looking for a man, and this left Burke. The match was scheduled for February, but no one had posted a farthing on Burke. So they called again on Vainglorious, but Vainglorious was gone, convicted of thieving and transported. They found a miller in Melchior Brown from Manchester, who had been breaking gobs on the tavern circuit under the nickname Sparrow. But Brown went down in just four rounds, and the next pick, Frank Smith, the picturesque, refused to fight blind man's murderous fists. So again they came looking for Burke. They decided Burke's mom's blood would get the Irish out, and blind man would draw the Scots, and if there was a riot, then all the better. Besides, everyone knew the best fighters wore the Bristol yellow, and by then Burke had moved out of the cave, showing his medal in a pair of battles at Egan's Abbey. Who is blind man? A Methuselah of 35, icon of Scottish nationalist, hero of boys' magazines, where he was drawn in monstrous proportions, sweeping Lilliputian armies down as if clearing a table for a game of cards. A dexterous hitter of steam engine power, 118 lost two, baptized Benjamin McGraw. He got his nickname in a fight in 14 in the 43rd round, with eyes so swollen by the punches that he couldn't see. Refused to have his lids lanced, saying he could beat his boy blind, and then leveled him hard as soon as they hit the scratch. After the fight, they asked how he'd done it, and he answered, I hit where the breathing was. He had a patron in the Earl of Balcaras, who was said to slum with McGraw in Glasgow's most notorious. He liked to tell Heidi how he'd even been asked to be the yeoman of the guard. With all the stories of cursing and rough living and all the girls he'd pollinated, the offer was rescinded. In 16, he'd knocked down the champion Simon Beale in two rounds, and Simon Beale never rose again. In the famous cartoon published in the Gazette, McGraw was drawn shaking his fists over a gravestone on which was written, Here in the shade lies Simon Beale, jaw of iron, fists of steel, War twenty, won 24 fights with nerve and zeal. At 25 showed his Achilles heel, took just two rounds for fate to seal, that no soul spared by fortune's wheel. Of course, there wasn't a man among the fancy who didn't doubt that Jacob Burke was going to get lathered. And Burke knew the rumors, but Karen and Yankee said he stood a chance that blind man was growing old and Burke was improving daily in strength and science. Truth was, Burke didn't need to be told which Cairn knew, for Cairn had been organizing fights for 13 years and knew there wasn't anything so proud as a 23-year-old, except maybe a 16-year-old, but try to find a neck like musculars on a kid. Only problem with Burke, he told him, only problem with you, is that Burke was too good and polite and he needed a little bit more meanness in him. Burke spent a good deal of time wondering about this, how a hitter could be a good man, wondering if he was good only because he was on the bottom and couldn't be anything else, that if conditions were different and he had something going, he wouldn't be so. Once in a pub, he'd heard, there's no such thing as a sin man, only a sin world, which he was told meant that the devil was in everyone and it was a rare fellow who could keep him down. Then later he started thinking that maybe he'd heard it wrong and it should have been, there's no such thing as a good man, only a good world. And he started repeating it enough that he couldn't remember if the basic situation was sin or good. Cairn said he was too good. But he knew inside that he hit because he liked the feeling of hitting the other fellow, which seemed at first like sin, but then he started thinking that if the other fellow were just like him, then the other fellow liked hitting too, and that meant he, Burke, was beating a sinner. And so he, Burke, was good, except when he looked at it the other way, then the other fellow was also clobbering a fellow who liked hitting him, Burke. This meant the other fellow was good, and Burke was a sinner for milling an upright man. The reasoning went around and around, like one of those impossible songs that never stopped, until Muscular decided 
that what he liked about the fight was that he didn't have to wonder about such questions, only hit, because if you didn't hit, you got hit. That was the answer, he thought. The day approaches. So Burke takes to training. Docks in the day, dumbbells at dusk. Karen has him running his dogs in the hills, hits the bags of sand, bans drink, and the amorous. The word spreads fast around Bristol. He hears a hush follow him when he walks. In the streets, he's besieged by the shoe shiners who beg to see standing flips and then sit on each other for the title of muscular. The girls lower their bonnets and lift their eyes when he rooster swaggers past. The posters grow up with sketches of the two men facing off as if they had posed together, shirtless and ankle boots and breeches tied close with sashes. They say the fight will be held at Mousley Hurst, southwest of London, but all know this is a sham to throw off the magistrates. The papers take to calling the fight blind man's brag, as if it were not a fight but a showcase for McGraw, as if Burke weren't even fighting. One night his mother is waiting for him when he comes home. They say you're going to get killed, she says. Who says that, asks Jacob. They all say that, she says. I've been to the market. They say, make sure they promise you the purse, Annie, because your boy isn't coming home. Unspoken but hidden in her words is his father, who's coughing himself to bones and hasn't been down to the docks in months. But she doesn't say Jacob should walk away. Had she, then he would have squared his jaw and proclaimed he had his honor to protect. It is because she says nothing more that the doubts begin to eel their way in. They find a patron. Two weeks before the fight, Karen quarries a patron in a Corinthian named Cavendish. The rest of the purse is put up by the pugilistic club. Cavendish meets Burke and Karen at Nag Landing's public house. He's a dandy, curls, perfume, talking proud and fast and high. Wants to be called Cav, but Jacob calls him Mr. Cavendish, and he smiles. He made his blunt during the regency and flaunts it, burns a bill before Burke's eyes. Recites a fight poem which he had published in Bell's Life, full of lettery words Burke has trouble getting his ears around. Cavendish tells a story about a fighter, laughing, says, Poor Tom had his eyes knocked from his head. Just like that, plop, plop, couldn't find work and suicided. Drank plusic, plop, he laughs. Burke hates him immediately, feels his whole body tense when he hears him talk. He knows Cavendish is trying to look big by making him look small, but he can't think of fast words to answer. Any other man, and he'd hit him so hard he'd lose more than his eyes. He looks to his trainer, and Karen tilts his head, just a little, as if to say, easy, swallow the toad. Cavendish is putting up the purse. Soaked, Cavendish begins to slur calls a wagtail over and throws an arm around her waist, tells Jacob to remove his shirt, says, look at the symmetry, look at the strength, says, your mom's Irish, Burke, calls him my little boy, touches his arms and says, look, this is pretty, drinks his blue ruin until it runs down his chin, says he was a boxer, but he holds his fists with his thumbs inside. They travel to the scene of the fight, spending a night, the night in a coaching inn where Burke meets a man who imparts his philosophy. The fight is set in Herefordshire in a field south of St. Albans called Dead Rabbit Heath. In St. Albans, they spend the night at a coaching inn. Karen and the Yankee drink until they're reeling, but Muscular is too nervous to keep anything down. The publican is an aficionado of the fistic. The walls are decorated with sketches and mezzotints of the great fighters, and Burke recognizes Broughton and, Ma and Painter and the Jews Mendoza and Dutch Sam and Gassman and Game Chicken. He wants to be like the portraits, still and quiet and distant on a watercolor patch, alone and glorious. But among the rabble that's crowding the tavern, Muscular is cornered by a farrier, a fat, spectacled man who seems to have some reading behind him. Says he was a priest once, which explains his fine diction though he won't say why they stripped his soutane. You'll be one of the greats, he tells Jacob. Just look at you. Maybe you'll lose tomorrow, but it doesn't matter. Just hold your own and soon you'll be champion. He asks Burke if he knows of the fight between Achilles and Hector, but Burke has never heard of these two fighters. The farrier shrugs it off. You ever seen McGraw, he asks. Burke hasn't, sketches only. Goliath, says the farrier like someone pressed two men into one, 
misshapen like that too, you'll see. Cauliflower ears. Ears, no, cauliflower face. He presses on. You want to hear my philosophy? How are you going to win? Think, my boy. You want to want to win or you want to hurt him? These are different things. Brown's theory of the fight, you can say, is that anger only takes a man so far. That's what all you poor boys start with, anger, needing it like a horse that needs a rider. But soon that gets in the way. You boys go out and think you're fighting a boxer, but really you're fighting the world. But a good fighter, you see, like blind man, he knows that the man he's fighting is fighting first to hurt and next to win. And he'll use it. Use your hating to get you. That's the difference. Men who fight to hurt will get it in their time. Gladiator in arena, concilium caput. He'll finish you, mill you to a jelly, get your head up in chancery, and then where will you find yourself? Burke doesn't have an answer. He stares at the man who's got whiskers thick as string. The man's going on about anger, and Burke's tempted to say there's no such thing as a sin man, only a sin world. I'm just hitting. He doesn't want to talk anymore, but he won't leave, won't go to sleep either. A tavern chant swells. Then let us be merry while drinking our sherry. He has a sick feeling and thinks maybe he is scared. They gather at Dead Rabbit Heath. Soon after sunrise, they take a coach. They pass crowds coming up the road, on horseback or foot. It is a cold morning, the light hesitant, the fields wet with the dew. It takes Burke a long time to realize that the crowd is there, in part, for him. They park their carriage in a small clearing halfway up the hill. Almost immediately, he is set upon by the tag rag, who jostle him for no reason but to try to get close. They sing, Gotta get the blind man, or the blind man gets you. Muscular wears his stovepipe low over his eyes. His seconds flank him, leading him up a long path through the wet grass, over a rise, and then down toward the ring. Both men hold him by his elbow. He knows it's supposed to comfort him, but there's no comfort there. He thinks, where do they flank men like this? And the answer is the gallows. As they approach, there's a massive crowd already gathered at the ropes, and he can hear a hushing in the near. He looks for his opponent, but blind man is nowhere to be seen. He wants blind man to be there, as if blind man's the only one who can know what he's feeling. The ground is turned up like a pack of pigs come rooting through, but the ring is clean, neat, covered with sand, like nothing he's ever fought in. They've strung two lines of painted rope. The scratch is already chalked. He keeps his great coat on as Karen goes and speaks to the judge. He feels the eyes of the crowd on him and tries to ignore them, looks down and keeps clenching his hands again and again. Finally, he lifts his face and looks out. The hill is all men, as far as the eye can reach. There's a pair of swells near him, ascots blooming, suits of bombazine, capes and pearl buttons. Hey, muscle, says one, and then laughs. I've got money on you, muscle, says the other. They're talking funny, and then he realizes they're mocking a brogue. He looks away. Karen comes back. This is big boy, he says. Ten thousand fellows, not a stable free for a sleepy nag. Half the country wants to see our boy fell the blind man. Cheers and jeers as his opponent approaches. Late in the morning, McGraw arrives, a dark hulk lumbering over his seconds. Around him, a quiet descends. At the edge of the ring, McGraw hands his great coat and hat to his second and steps inside. From his corner, Burke watches blind man strip to his colors. Jacob Burke has prepared himself for a giant, but he doesn't think he's ever seen such a human as this. McGraw must be 18 stone, six foot six at least, but the illusion of height is increased by the size of his chest and belly, which set his head back like some faraway peak. Arms as thick as muscular as hams, fists slung low, skin is pale blotched red. To call his ears cauliflower would be a compliment. Tuber is more like it, thinks Burke, a raw tuber that could break a knuckle. His nose is a gray yellow color that makes it look like a dead man's nose. There is so much in him that it is difficult for Burke to see where the man's muscles begin. He looks like someone has taken a massive sculpture of a strong man and kept throwing clay on it in lumps until the clay ran out. Burke doesn't even know where he's going to land his fists. It seems like certain rules, like rules against grabbing the throat, don't matter when it comes to blind man for Burke is uncertain where the neck ends and the head begins. He feels, as if, he feels as if 
he would as if, if he were told to lift an awkward stone without a place to set his hands. He realizes then that he has been seduced by the promotion posters which show the men facing off as if they were two men fighting. This isn't two men fighting. He thinks of the games of speculation he played as a child. If a lion fought a bear, if a tur turtle fought a buck, if a shark fought a giant fox, if an eagle fought a man of fire, who would win? Who would kill who? If muscular Burke fought the monster McGraw, it is then that Jacob realizes he has been set up to lose, that Cairn and the Yankee could never have expected him to stand a chance against blind man. He looks back out at the crowds. Now they stretch all the way to the crest of the hillside. The sound of their chanting is deafening, but he hears only blind man. They are there to watch blind man win or blind man lose, curse and praise, but only blind man's name. The crowd doesn't even seem to acknowledge Burke thinks Burke, who cheers the fox when you've come to watch the hound? The fight begins. The patters are at the ropes. There are six of them, a quintet of London Coleman and an ostler who's retired from the fistic. Their jackets are off, their cuffs rolled, fighting to keep the crowds back. Muscular realizes that while he's been lost in thought, his arms loose at his sides, his seconds have stripped him to his breeches. He stands in a daze, he realizes he's staring into the crowd, looking for someone he knows, another lifter from the docks, or thinking frantically now, a brother or even his mother, when Karen whispers something in his ear. He's almost forgotten his second, but now Karen is behind him, his hands on Burke's shoulders, massaging the massive deltoids of which he is so proud. Jacob shivers him off. Is he in on this, he wonders? How much is he being paid to have me killed? He shakes his head to rid himself of this thought. Behind him, he hears Karen's voice. Show him, muscular. He coaxes Burke's arms into the air, and Burke flexes. That's right, muscular, says Karen. Show the old man. What are the odds, whispers Jacob through his teeth. What am I at? Karen rubs his shoulders. Don't worry, boy. You do the milling, and I'll do the bedding, and we'll both go home rich men. He laughs, but Jacob doesn't join. No matter how he tries to throw his anger back towards the giant in the ring, he feels only betrayal, fury for his handlers for what is about to happen. The thought that Karen and Yankee want him to lose vanishes, but what remains is somehow worse, that he is inconsequential to them. He should sit, lay down, get back to the rat, to the case side, to home. They are called to the scratch. The judge joins the patters in the outer ring. Burke sees Cavendish in the front low, row, toppered in a white stovepipe that is immaculately, impossibly clean. Besides him, the jostling betters, the flit fluttering fingers of a tic-tac man. The two fighters shake. McGraw's paws are like the rest of him, geologic. And while Jacob has a grip that can shatter a bottle, he can't even get a purchase on the Scotsman's hand. Time is kept by a lord from Essex. The judge launches his cant, promising strength and speed and stamina, a battle of brawn, a beautiful combat, a most severe contest for the benefit of honorary gentlemen. The crowd erupts. May the best man win, says the judge. Fists up. Fists up and in the crouch, Burke can't hear the bell for all the shouting. Before him, McGraw holds his pose, shoulders squared, his face a mask, waiting for the boy to come. Burke wants to strike, but he can't move, can't see a line through the giant's arms. Blind man makes a kissing motion, and the crowd roars. Muscle, muscle, comes a taunt, and out of the corner of his eye, Burke sees the two swells laughing, and besides them, Cavendish doing nothing to fight off a smile. Off the scratch, he strikes blind man's jaw. The champion doesn't budge. Again, Burke strikes, and blind man stops it with his left, makes a fake of mock surprise, brushes his arm as if brushing off a fly, flourishes his fists. It's a show for the crowd, and they reward it with laughter. Burke rushes again, feeling the same time as if a brick has come down against his head. Muscular down. Karen takes him back to the corner, sits him, whispers. Tire him muscular, feet muscular, quick on the pins, dance like Mendoza. But Burke pushes him away angrily, is back to the scratch before the Lord says 30. Throws the instant blind man gets up from the corner. Foul he hears, but before they can pull him back, he's down again, unaware of what happened. 
He tastes dirt this time, hears the judge call for his blood, and feels his cheek is wet. Hears numbers, can't distinguish the crowds shouting from the roaring in his ear. Back to the scratch and muscular down. Back to the scratch, blind man charges, muscular swings and blind man down. The hillside roars like artillery fire. Then McGraw's up, his flesh shifting and shimmering. Burke advances. He can't think now. He can only move. The fight continues. The rounds seem to roll through him. A hook into blind man's ear, Burke in the mouth. One, two, one, two, blood, tooth, and muscular down. Jab to the nose and blind man down. Back to the scratch and muscular pounds to the pudding bag, to the ear, to the ear, and the ear seems to crunch, break like a potato beneath a heel. Blind man down. Back to the scratch and blind man rushes. Bread basket, bread basket, muscular down. Topper in the ear and muscular down. Pirouette turn and blind man rushes. Muscular back catches a heel and both men down. Back to the scratch, fast in the eye, muscular down. Again, to the peeper, muscular down. Blind man muzzled and muscular down. Blind man coughs, spits out a grinder. Chop and chop and muscular down. Back to the scratch and muscular down. Blind man, blind man, muscular down. Eyelids swollen, tasting blood on his tongue, his knuckles wet with gore. Burke sits in the corner, letting Cairn's hands caress his chest. Yankee sponge his face. He feels as if his men aren't there. He's being touched by bird's wings. He wants at McGraw, needs to hit. It hurts to breathe. He doesn't know how much lung he's got in him. But something in him says he's taken the worse. That blind man's not going to hit any harder than he's hit. But that Burke's still got it. Still could heave a load. He murmurs a lifter's song. Still lift the barrel, still lift the barrel, still lift the barrel. Hey, 12 kittens in the kitchen and another's on the way. His lips swollen blubber. He rinses his mouth with old Tom, rinse, rises before the 30, and is at the scratch before blind man stands. By now the crowd is thundering, pressing up against the ropes, throwing punches at the patters, curses flying. Again Burke rushes, rushes. McGraw catches his wrist this time, turns with a force and throws him, coming down with his knee in Burke's gut. Muscular's mouth fulls with bile, his pants grow wet. He hears hissing and a crowd cry of foul. But McGraw, snorting through his broken nose, doesn't care. He cradles Burke's head, whispers something rasped into his ear, kicks Muscular in the flanks as he's standing up. Again, foul. But this is coming from the crowds, closer, and Burke sees a man breach the outer ring, hurling ugly curses at the Scot, followed by another and another, and Burke, up on his knees, thinks, here we go. And he isn't even standing when the punches start flying. Pandemonium in the ring. At times, the two fighters join forces to restore order. A gas man hits a livery man, hits a brewer, hits a baker. Two swells pound each other as if to send each to his maker. An ostler lands a muzzler while his best man lands a Quaker. The patters overwhelm, the ropes broken, the crowd implodes into the ring. They don't seem to be after the pugilists, but one another, though muscular spinning, can't seem to make heads or tails of what's happening. There's a mob come down cursing the Scot. There's cane swinging and stones thrown and someone heaving a rope and the air is filled with curses, all kinds of animal and things that are going to be done in a liberal use of the monosyllable. Then muscular and blind man have joined the patters, pounding to clear the ring because both are hungry for the fight. Blind man is red-faced and breathing heavily. Rested, muscular feels the strength in him returning. But what has become of muscular's eyes? Time has played blind man's ally. By now, muscular can barely see. Both of his eyes are weeping, swollen shut, crusting over. With the stage reclaimed and the patters back at the ropes, the boxers repair to their seconds. In the corner, Cairn runs his, th runs his thumbs over muscular's lids. You're out, he says. You're out or I cut them. And Jacob just nods. Cairn pushes his head back, grabs the lancet, grabs his head, and the relief is immediate. His face streams with the claret. His cheeks feel as if he's been crying. Back to the scratch, and McGraw is fighting dirty, but the judge lets it fly. He's angry, thinks Burke. He knows this should have gone on this long. It was supposed to be easy, done. So now it's Burke who leads. Forward now, and blind man back. Fists up, and McGraw circle. Scratches the ground as if to get purchased with his boots. Muscular sees it then. Sees his channel in. Not now but two moves from now, like a game of checkers. Feels the warmth in his arms, feels joy, 
thinks this is glorious. Fane's high and McGraw goes high, and then Jacob Burke is inside. Left the jaw and blind man ducks, straight into Burke's right and rising. Jacob Burke knows then that the fight is over, hears it, something slacken, something soft, something broken in the jaw or in the face, something creaking in the temple. He's worked shipbreaking at times, and there's a feeling when a sledgehammer comes against a beam and nothing breaks, but you know the next time you swing, it's going to give. The fight's over. Blind man is standing, but Burke has only to wait, and blind man will fall. An expression comes over blind man's face, a puzzled expression, like he's hearing a song he's never heard before, at which point Burke has a very complicated thought. Jacob Burke's thought takes the form of a memory. In his childhood on the docks, like all boys, Jacob and his friends spent days in games of earnest battle, clashing sticks and throwing stones long into the dark, chasing and fighting and raising hell. They played by the universal rules of cruelty and chivalry and thrill, thrill to strike and throw and be thrown at. And throwing and chasing one day, Jacob and three friends had cornered a knight of the opposing army and were taunting him before delivering the coup de grace, which in such a situation with such easy prey typically consisted of touching him with a stone or tossing it lightly as the boy was trapped against a wall and had no way to escape. But that afternoon, the boy, who was a bit younger than the rest, went scared on him and started to cry, and surrounding him, the others began to laugh and throw. Then the boy was crying louder, which only made the others laugh louder and throw harder, and then the boy was slobbering for his mother, and they all went grabbing more stones and throwing, and Burke reached down and felt his fist close around a stone, which she knew was too big for that game, but the crying had removed from him any restraint, and laughing, he took hard aim at the head of the boy, and he threw. The end. Watching from the crowds, amidst the th cheers and curses, there's not a soul that day at Dead Rabbit's Heath that knows what Jacob Burke knows, that the fight is already over. For blind man's standing and blind man's fists are still up, and if he's slack in the lip, no one can see from what muscular Jacob Burke has done to his face. They'll know, in breaths they'll know, and for years they'll talk about it, but in this half second, between muscular's knowing and the crowd's knowing, it's as if Muscular has been left alone with a knowledge and an omnipotence only God should have. There is a moment when a lifter takes a load and heaves it onto his shoulder, when the massive weight, the sack or the crate or the barrel at the top of its heave becomes briefly weightless, and the lifter, no matter how tired he may be, poised between his action and the consequences of his action, feels both an incredible lightness and the power of the weight at the same time. It is as if he is a master of the weight, not struggling below it. And Jacob Burke has learned over the years to seek this joy, is hooked on this joy, knows secretly that in the misery of everything else, there is one moment when he is king. Maybe he thinks this, or maybe he feels it in the movement of his arms. For now, there is no difference between thinking or feeling or hitting. Blind man's fists are down, and Muscular comes in on his man. He's feeling for the break, the hole, the soft, searching again for that seam, hitting, hitting, that half second gone, and now there's no turning back, hitting, knowing that what he told, when he told himself he hit so he wouldn't be hit, he was lying, because beneath it, the reason he hit is that there was joy in hurting, real joy and simplicity, and the freedom and the astounding number of answers in the single moment of his arm, movement of his arms. Later he'll have pity, but not now. Now there is no pity, not because he is cruel, but because there is no more Ben McGraw. For Muscular is alone, mind clear of all, but such joy and beauty as he moves in, striking his man, searching, knowing there is only one way that he wants this to end, only one ecstatic way for it to end, only one, and hitting, he thinks, blind man, I'm hitting blind man, I'm hitting Cairn, I'm hitting Cairn, I'm hitting Cav, I'm hitting Cairn, I'm hitting Cav, I'm hitting blind man, I'm hitting Cav, and then feeling the soft thinks, I'm in the break, thinks in the crown, thinks in the line, thinks into McGraw, thinks. There's a line into McGraw, into the soft into McGraw, into the crown of Ben McGraw, into the temple of McGraw, the broken temple of McGraw, the broken temple of McGraw, thinks there's no such thing as a fast man, only a slow world, thinks break, break, blind man down.
That's it. Thanks. I have Airbox now. <laughs> I wanted to, but. <laughs> sure. For the piano tuner? Um, let's see. Uh, I had, um, I was in school then, like Melanie said, um, and I had spent a year before I started school um, doing medical malaria research in Thailand and Burma on the Burmese border. Um, and I came back um, to, to school. Um, and I think at that point was, like the story grow, grew initially almost from like in a, sort of an internal need to reconcile um, both this extremely different experience which I just had um, with this, the day-to-day day um, day responsibilities, I suppose, of being in school. And so it began really as like an escape or a return or I don't know, like an attempt to adjust a disorientation um, that, that so, so that it was a, so, so I wanted somehow to write about some to, to deal with this idea of disorientation, what happens when somebody has an experience which ultimately changes them or sees, it, sees something that ultimately changes them um, and has a difficult time returning to the state of the person they were before. So it, it came from that. And then, um, I guess, as Melanie and Vikram could, could tell you, they, 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 I guess the story had its own kind of strange path. And um, I, I had wanted to, to write a story. You know, it seemed to, to express that disorientation in a physical thing um, was a good idea and that physical thing became a piano and then a pianist seemed less interesting to me than a piano tuner and, and sort of like bit by bit the whole thing began coming together but it began with this very general um, with this very general attempt to just kind of process this, this idea of what happens when um, one experiences a, a rather sudden break between worlds. Does that sort of answer your question? So I think uh-huh. Hey, Joe. <laughs> when you think about why you started this song with the heading, almost like the theme, um, did you have a particular reason or a influence that made you choose that song for the story? Yeah. Um, so th the question was why I chose. Th the story is broken up. I don't know how easy it was to tell when I was reading it, but it's sort of broken up into chapters, and I was almost tempted to say chapter one, chapter two, chapter three. So when you read it, it, it it's broken into these chapters of about three or four paragraphs a piece. Um, I can't remember particularly with this how that's, that started. Uh, it, it, once it sort of began, it seemed to fit pretty well with the structure of a boxing match being rounds, uh, and so that these were a series of, of rounds. I was also reading a lot of boxing narratives um, of the boxing matches from this time, and um, they're narrated as rounds. So th then the whole story became the whole story became rounds. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, whether the story is an exploration of violence. Yeah, I think that. Um, I think that. And both from both from sort of personal experience, having been a uh, an adolescent boy, um, and finding myself uh, finding myself in situations where sort of a crowd gets uh, kind of gets its temper up, and uh, there seems to be this this energy or this an inertia to to this kind of violence that it's that it's hard to stop and being interested in that to explore um, drove the story a little bit, and then I think just. Also, I have a tendency, and the piano tuner is, the piano tuner is, is really kind of a, a pacifist novel, um, and I think that at the at the same time of writing that novel, I I wasn't 
answering in a way this, this question, which is why are so many people doing this, fighting? And like, I mean, having grown up in, uh, in California and um, you know, like be sort of being steeped in, in pacifism, it's, 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 it was nice to, to think about that the, this is the way that the world should be, but it never seemed to explain to me that behind this desire to fight, there is a desire to, to fight and that this joy that seems t to come um, upon people when they hurt other people uh, is, a difficult, is difficult to, to understand. And so the story is an exploration of that. Um, not to say that like, I w it, it's, for it's foreign to me, he's a foreign character to me, um, but it is something that like, I've s maybe seen a little bit, um, just it, you, like, you, you sense it rising when the, in, in the anger of a fight, in the hot moment of a fight. Yeah, so that, that's why, so there's, there's a whole, the whole story was there, except for that flashback scene. Um, and the flashback scene w was, was meant to kind of take it out of that context, um, out of the fight and, and break it up. And there were times I thought of including it and, and not including it, um, but, but it's there now. So. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming. And thank you for inviting me. <laughs>